Virgin 3.6. The version where all theories go to die. Just kidding, this changes nothing. But it did fill in some blanks and I am thrilled to be able to pop a few of these new puzzle pieces right into place. Finally, the timeline begins to make a little bit more sense. Now this video will be compiling everything we learned from Nahida's second story quest as well as the Kavarana of Good and Evil world quest, which I'm just gonna call the fairy quest. Oh, and before we start, I just want to mention that if you'd like a full chronological timeline of all the historical events in Sumeru, I will leave a link in the description to my Beginner's Guide to Genshin Lore Sumeru Edition. I think it'll help put some of the events found in the 3.6 quests into context, and for that reason I won't be going into too much detail about the overall timeline in this video, okay? So we have a lot to get through and I don't really know where to start, so I'm just gonna pick a topic at random and here we go. Apep is the first ancient dragon that we've met still in her original form. Ejdaha was sealed and eroding to the point where he was merely a shadow of his former self, and Dvalin is a wee little baby. No, really, like, Dvalin is really super young in dragon years. Comparatively, anyway. Now, Apep confirms that she was around in a time before Celestia and the Heavenly Principles, and that Sumeru was her territory, which may, emphasis on the may, make her one of the original seven dragon sovereigns that ruled Tevat before humans. She also tells of a war between the dragons and the Heavenly Principles, who appeared to be not native to Tevat, and this war nearly destroyed the entire world. This is in line with what we know from the book Before Sun and Moon, which says that the Primordial One, who would be the Heavenly Principles in this case, fought and won a war against the dragons. But Apep's story begins to differ from our only Genesis record in that she claims Sumeru was originally a lush rainforest under her rule. But according to Before Sun and Moon, the Primordial One was the one to create all life, including plant life. But this is obviously not the case if Sumeru was already a rainforest before their arrival. Thus, I think the only thing that can be attributed to the Primordial One from Before Sun and Moon is the creation of humans and the firmament. Unless you want to claim that the Primordial One created a bunch of new types of plants, which, in that case, yeah, sure, that's plausible, but they didn't create the concept of plants, which makes them a little less godlike. But we'll touch on this a little bit more later. Now, this book series here states that Bishops originally lived in the Light Realm, which is synonymous with the Elemental Realm. Bishop is the Armenian word for dragon, so this statement would include notable dragons like Dvalin and Ejdaha, which makes sense because they appear to be made from pure elemental energy, which is in stark contrast being said to be from the so-called Human Realm. Those beings cannot innately use elemental energy, but instead have to borrow it from the environment around them. This is likely why humans are said to require visions in order to manipulate the elements. They're not native. What's curious here is that the so-called light or elemental realm appears to be just normal to that. Apep ruled the same land that Nahida now rules, so it wasn't technically recreated as the book states. Terraformed, maybe. And plus, the Dragon King, Nibelung, believed that they could leverage Forbidden Knowledge to fight the invading Heavenly Principles, and we know that Forbidden Knowledge comes from the Abyss, which is also known as the Void Realm. So when the people of Enkanamiya talked about the three realms, the Light, Human, and Void Realms, they seemed to be describing Tvat as it already existed during the Era of Dragons, with the Light Realm being Tvat, an elemental realm ruled by dragons, the Void Realm being the Abyss, full of forbidden knowledge, and the Human Realm being something kind of new brought in by the invaders. So the heavenly principles and the stuff they made. I promise we'll come back to the Nibelung thing later, just bear with me. Previously, it had been implied that the Primordial One created the world by combining the three realms, but now it seems like that's pretty inaccurate. They didn't recreate the world at all. What they did do is hurl a celestial nail down at the Earth, or many of them, actually. One of these nails hit Sumeru and instantly turned the entire rainforest into a vast desert, so I suppose if similar things happened elsewhere, we could say they recreated the land through a type of terraforming again. But it's nowhere near the omniscient levels of divine creation as you would expect from something equivalent to the god of all gods, right? I want to explore this idea a lot more in the finale of my Colony to That series, but before we move on, fun fact. 
The goddess of flowers, prior to being cast out of Celestia, used to dance upon the dunes with the three sisters of the moon, implying that the three moon sisters existed post-dragon battle, since there would have been no desert dunes until after the celestial nails struck Sumeru. So, the death of the three moon sisters would have happened before the Archon War, since the goddess of flowers was exiled after their deaths and met Deshret long after that. And it was only after Deshret and the goddess of flowers became friends that Celestia offered Deshret a gnosis, which should have taken place during the Archon War, which started at least 3,000 years ago. And given that Ruka Devada is both younger than Apep and the creator of the forests of Sumeru, she would have had to have been born after this celestial nail in the desert dropped. And since she's the avatar of Erminsul, that means that Erminsul is very possibly younger than the dragons. It could very well be a creation of the Primordial One, but that's heavy speculation territory, which means we'll have to talk about it in another upcoming video. For now, here's my conclusion with the rough order of historical events. First, dragons ruled the whole world, it was theirs. Then the Primordial One came and invaded and smote them all. Then humans took over under the guidance of the Moon Sisters and the Seelies. Then the moons died and the goddess of flowers was exiled, and around the same time Enkanamiya should have sunk beneath the sea. Then Deshret and the goddess of flowers would have met and become friends, also Ruka Devada at some point in there. And then the Archon War happened, and then we're caught up. At this point, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the death of the Moon Sisters is what triggered the Archon War, but I lack solid evidence for this, so that's just speculation for now. All of this is speculation. Why, why am I adding a disclaimer? Anyway, moving on. A history lesson wasn't the only thing that Apep gave us. She also gave us a little insight into the nature of forbidden knowledge as well as elemental energy's relationship with memories. See, Erminsul and its leyline network collect a mix of elemental energy and memories, but the relationship between the two was never really clear. But Apep states that memories of her fragments have been converted into elemental energy and therefore reassimilated inside of her. This means that elemental energy and memories are interchangeable. Again, I have a whole video on this topic in the works, so forgive me if I don't dive too deeply into the implications of this for right now. But all of this explains why Nahida shrinks and loses her memories every time she releases massive amounts of her energy. As a god, she's primarily made up of raw elemental energy, so if she spends that energy, she's literally paying the price with the makeup of her body. And that same energy is interchangeable with her memories. Worth pointing out too that the Azocyte that powers Conrian technology is actually elementally based. It's the result of fusing together all seven types of elemental energy and the result of that is a gold power source like the power of the twins. This is the point when I realize that outside of the opening cutscene, the only times we've seen the twins successfully use their special gold power is when there are other characters spanning all seven elements present. And curiously, there's no mention of forbidden knowledge or abyssal energy being used in Conrian technology. If it runs on elemental energy, then that might be why. Now, previously, we've just assumed that forbidden knowledge was incompatible with other forms of energy or memory since it's known to corrupt things. However, a pep implies that she possesses the ability to decrypt it in small quantities, and it's possible that the Dragon King Nibelung had this ability as well since they also wanted to use it to fight heaven. Ironically, King Deshret also had this plan to fight heaven using the exact same method as the dragons. Acquire forbidden knowledge and use it to do something against the heavenly principles? And how curious is it that the sustainer of heavenly principles kinda looks corrupted? Now, is that corruption from the Dragon King or Deshret or the second who came? Who knows? Again, we'll talk about this more in another video. Regardless of who it was, Deshret acquired so much forbidden knowledge with the assistance of the Goddess of Flowers that when Apep swallowed his dead body whole, as agreed, she was unable to process the sheer amount of the forbidden knowledge and it really messed with her head and body, which was also apparently part of Deshret's plan. We'll also talk about this god-eating thing in a minute, so stay focused. If you think about it, forbidden knowledge can be straight up deleted by Erminsul, so if Deshret wanted to leverage that power against heaven itself, he would have needed to have a way to prevent them from just deleting his weapon. Now, Nahida says that forbidden knowledge cannot be preserved, but that it can be converted into another form. 
What I think she means here is that she was able to delete all the forbidden knowledge in the world when she messed with Erminsel, but only in the form that she recognized. We've seen that forbidden knowledge can be converted into other forms, like the dark mud in the chasm, and that that change was different enough to make it exempt from deletion, so it's possible that Deshret's plan may have been more of an experiment trying to understand how forbidden knowledge interacts with elemental energy and how he could prevent its deletion. More on Deshret in a bit, but another fun fact, it seems like one of the fragments of a pep was actually responsible for using that celestial nail in the chasm to convert all of the forbidden knowledge in the area into the mud, which apparently a slightly more stable form and therefore less toxic. Now, this is less of a fun fact and more of just a nitpick on my part, but Nahida's deletion of forbidden knowledge still feels a bit contentious to me because outside of the converted mud, withering stones still persist post-deletion. There are a couple of lines that say that deleting the forbidden knowledge left a void behind, and that void is what made the fragments of a pep sick. And those sick fragments degraded until they turned into tumors of the withering, and since she can't delete a void, those zones persisted. And I guess it makes sense, but it's kind of weird, and I, I, don't, I don't really like it. Okay, now it's Deshret time. Apep confirmed that Deshret's demon name is Amun, which confirms that he's a reference to the Egyptian sun god Amun-Ra, and it's incredibly fitting that Apep swallowed him whole because in Egyptian mythology, the serpent Apep does in fact swallow the sun god Ra whole every night. Now before you all say, Deshret is dead, stop talking about him, I don't care, I will first direct you to my Beginner's Guide to Sumeru video for the timeline specificity, and then I will remind you that Deshret planned to get eaten. In fact, we have records that Deshret died by sitting on the throne of the Golden Slumber, and his body was then eaten by worms. This worm, apparently a very big worm. I'm making a pun here, it only works when it's written down though. But the thing is, he didn't actually die here, not completely. Part of the goal of the Golden Slumber was for him to find a way to separate body and soul, which he seems to have done rather successfully. A pep ate his body, but Nahida would later seal his soul deep underground. So as far as I'm concerned, Deshret's still in the game, and there's still a good chance that he's the sinner. In fact, I was going to make this topic into its own video and I still might, but for now I have to talk about it here because it's relevant. In my Kari Bear analysis video, I made the case for Kave to be an allegory for Deshret as his incarnation as a sun deity. Not a reincarnation, mind you, just an allegorical one. For literary purposes only. Kave is thematically colored in red, fitting for the Scarlet King, and he wears earrings that match the architectural symbolism inside some of the tombs, and he even created an artificial intelligence, ironically naming it Marak, which means little sun or little light. Plus, he's an architect, and Deshret was a very prolific builder and machinist. Kave also uses the morning flowers for his ascension items, and this flower appears to be based on this real-world flower, which is aptly named the Red Crown. Now, I, among others, have proposed that Deshret, the Black Sun of the Desert, bears a striking resemblance to the Black Star of Conria, and at the end of the Pari quest, we get to go to a door that leads directly to Conria, and at that door, there is a single morning flower. And yeah, I know this flower might supposed to be representing the person who died here that was, like, written in the letter, but uh, bear with me. Kave's constellation is literally the same as Kaya's, but with the bird's wings open instead of closed, and I don't think that's a coincidence either. Plus, I am thoroughly convinced that Deshret is supposed to be based at least in half on Auto Apocalypse from Honkai Impact, and if you put the two side by side, yeah, they kind of fit. Especially if you're familiar with Honkai's story and you know anything at all about Otto. I mean, this might actually start to make sense, especially if you look at Nahida as being Teresa and Ruka Devada as being Colin. And um, I, I could go down the Honkai hole for like an hour, and so I don't want to do that right now. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And yeah, okay, I'm a little bit biased. I really like Kave, so people are probably sitting there like, what about I'll hate them? He has the same eyes as Deshred. Shouldn't he be the incarnation of Deshred as well? Do you see any raw symbolism? on this guy, like really, he's green for one, he's not red, it's a Scarlet King. But you know, you're still not totally off base. I do think Al Haytham is still an allegory for Deshret, just in a different form. 
Consider, if Deshret died and managed to separate his soul from his body, then he is now a ghost of a dead god, or maybe a god of the dead, like Osiris. Now Osiris has coloring that matches Alhatham. His constellation is also that of a vulture, and that's very fitting for the god of the dead, and the symbolism on his chest is found on a mural in Gurabad which lines up with the timeline around the time when Deshret should have died. So Alhatham having Deshret's eyes makes sense because Deshret that we've seen isn't in his raw state, but in his Osiris state. This is also probably why Aru Village, which was founded upon Deshret's ideals, is named after Osiris's realm, the Field of Reeds. It's also kind of ironic and just very fitting that Alhatham's story quest is a cautionary tale about hive minds when Deshret as Ra literally built a hive mind, the Golden Slumber. And if you think about Kave as being like the Ra one, and how canonically Alhatham's always telling him to like, stop burning yourself out, stop trying to help other people, stop doing this, stop doing that. Like it's just, it's just fitting. It's like the angel and the devil on your shoulder. Anyway, I might still make this into its own video because there's there's a lot to cover and I have like a million Honkai Impact connections that I want to make here, but for the sake of brevity and your sanity, I'll stop. We'll talk about something else now. Okay, I lied. Listen, everything in the desert dies back to Desert and the Goddess of Flowers and the story of the Peri is no different. So in his attempt to fight heaven, Deshret needed to convince the goddess of flowers to help him. She thought his chances of success were very, very bleak. So before she granted him access to forbidden knowledge, and who the heck knows why she had access to that in the first place, the goddess of flowers created a daughter, which gets called the Kavarna a bunch of times. And I'm probably butchering that. I'm sorry. I'm trying my best. The Kavarna literally means divine spark or power. So functionally, the goddess of flowers was just taking chunks of her divinity or her elemental energy and giving it a new external shape to protect the land while she was gone. Now she gave this daughter over to Ruka Devada before following Deshret to her death. The Kavarna lived with Ruka Devada for a time before the Dendro Archon reshaped her into a divine bird that she calls the Simurg. The Simurg would leave for the Vorukasha Oasis, where she would then go on to raise Lilupar's son, Kisra, and then sleep until the Cataclysm, supposedly. According to the other Archons, Celestia instructed them to go to Conria to deal with the monster infestation that was pouring out from beneath the earth. It was assumed that all Archons went there, but it turns out that two of them at least never made it. Rukudavada and the former Hydro Archon both went to Tanigi Hollow, where the former Hydro Archon died, her body rupturing and turning into the pristine waters of the Amrita. Ruka Devada then grew a great tree from her remains to anchor her soul to the mortal realm, then she left the area to tend to Ermansol. This left the responsibility of driving back the Abyss to the Simurg. So to do this, the Simurg decided to dive into the Amrita to harness its powers, but instead of gaining its powers, it shattered into thousands of tiny petals. Some of these petals were blessed by the Amrita and became the race known as the Peri, while the rest of these little bits of the Simurg became these little green fairies which are called, get this, the power of the Kavarna. Now one of the Academia's former Darshans joined up with the Pari and took arms against the Abyss, earning them the titles of Nagarjunites, or the Order of Skeptics, depending on who you ask. At some point during the Cataclysm, Zervon, the very first of the Peri, had a chance encounter with Dainsleth, who was clutching a single ring in his hand, we'll come back to this. He joined Zervon in the fight against the Abyss and later had a one-armed sage from the east join them as well. Uh, Conry and lore aside, the genealogy here is very interesting because these little dudes technically have three moms. Basically, the original deity was the goddess of flowers who crafted the Kavarna, who was then transformed into a Persian phoenix by the Dendro Archon, who was then split into little seely looking flower floaties and green fairies by the former Hydro Archon's dead god juice. It really makes you take a second look at all the Seelies, and also at the elemental entities that lived inside of a pep, because they look a hell of a lot like the Kavarna fairies, and if both are made out of pure concentrated dendro energy, the similarities start to make some more sense. Consider the fact that Venti was just another one of a thousand winds, and he's got a pretty similar look to the Kavarna in his original form. It's very possible that he's like a peri-equivalent of Istaroth. 
What's kind of cool about these little sprites is that they explain some oddities about Rukadavada's actions during the Cataclysm as described in the Folio of Foliage. For example, when it says Lotuses bloomed at her feet, this may have been because the Kavarna sprites were aiding her in combat. They had the power of the goddess of flowers, who had lotuses and padisaras appear whenever she walked, so it makes sense for this trait to show up alongside Rukadavada here. I also want to point out that the fire seed Nahida used could very well have been a crystallized divine spark of a pep for use in emergency situations. After all, we know that when very powerful elemental creatures have their energies violently dispersed, they warp the land. Havria turned everyone into salt, Orobashi turned into the Tataragami, Guizhong seems to have become a thick dust cloud that blots out the sky, and a pep would, in theory, cause the rainforest to explode with growth. Now with that in mind, let's talk Dragon King for a second, because I missed this detail the first time through, but a pep says that not only was the Dragon King killed, but that he came back long after the world had been overtaken by the Heavenly Principles. But we haven't heard a damn thing about this so-called Dragon King in modern times, or in any books, for that matter. Or have we? Now, you may have seen this theory that Wei made, suggesting that Zhongli may be a shade of the primordial one. Let me put a new spin on this idea. Zhongli is the only Archon thus far to have a draconic form. His arms are veined in gold, and he's got more suspicious imagery surrounding him than you can shake a stick at. Like, take this for example. His constellation matches up with this symbol at the top of the domain mural that many thought represented the primordial one and its four shades. But what if Zhang Li is actually the second coming of the Dragon King, but might not know it? What if he's a bit like Nahida, that after dying or expending massive amounts of energy, he is eventually reborn, but without memories? Memories and elemental energy are interchangeable, after all. Now, this theory is obviously not fully formed yet, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on because I have suspicions, especially because I made this one video a really long time ago about Zhang Li being a dragon prince in light of there being a dragon king. I, I just, I wonder. I mean, obviously that theory is probably very wrong, but the idea, the idea is there and I wonder, I wonder. Although, a pep calls a dragon king Nibelung, and this name is a very overt reference to the Germanic Nibelungenlied, which is best known by its operatic adaptation, The Ring Cycle by Wagner. Now, in the epic and the opera, the Nibelung are a race of dwarves ruled over by a dwarf king named Albrecht, who only got the position because he stole all of the powerful gold from the daughters of the River Rhine, so the Rhine daughters, and fashioned it into a ring of power. Now, Amfortus Albrick became the regent of Conria, taking over for King Ermin when he became indisposed, while Clotar Albrecht went on to form the Abyss Order hundreds of years later. Dainzelif was found in Sumeru during the Cataclysm, clutching a ring. So you remember how I mentioned many, many, many times in many videos that King Deshret might be King Ermin, or at least was responsible in part for the founding of Conria? Well, Deshret wanted to use the same plan as Nibelung, the Dragon King, and leverage forbidden knowledge from the Abyss to overthrow Heaven. Similar goals and methods, all leading back to a ring carried by one of a few Conrian survivors. Now, there are a couple of interesting theories out there, like this one by Roosevelt, suggesting that Conrians may possess dragon blood, and that might be more likely than you'd think. China holds dragons as the most divine of all creatures, and that's why they were the symbol of royalty. And the regent family was named after the dwarf Albrick. And the only other dwarven names I can remember in this game right now are Dvalin and Durin, and those are both the names of dragons. Even Dainsliff is the name of a sword crafted by dwarves. It's a very interesting literary choice if there's nothing more to it. In case any of you weren't convinced by this point that Hoyoverse really loves Nibelunganlied, I hope you're convinced by now. Oh, and there's a really good chance that the Nibelunganlied epic is going to get mixed with legends surrounding the Holy Grail, specifically from the opera Parsifal, which was also written by Wagner. Stories about the Holy Grail is where the name Amfortis comes from. He was the Fisher King, who was the name for a person whose responsibility was to protect the Holy Grail. The Swan Knights from Conria also appear to be in the story of Parsifal, which is another name for Percival, and 
Arthurian knight who sought out the Holy Grail and who also features as the main character for another one of Wagner's operas, Parsifal. And the Swan Knight makes an appearance in another opera of Wagner called Lohengrin, wherein the main character, Lohengrin, is the Swan Knight himself. Lohengrin is even Parsifal's son, so the connections here are not arbitrary. But that will not stop me from making an arbitrary transition into an entirely new topic. Now, I have been screaming about the false sky since version 1.1, and this Perry quest just messed with my head. So the whole quest that you do with Sorush is about fixing the sky. Kind of. The Pari and the skeptics say that the oasis tree is merely showing an illusion of the abyss in the sky. But honey, I got news for you. It's far more likely that the energy from the tree that is blasting the sky is actually revealing what's truly beyond the firmament, the false sky. But it's kind of trippy because if you go and stand on this hole in the ground and then you look down, you'll realize that your vantage point is from the hole in the sky. You're literally looking down on the tree that's halfway across the desert, which means that the gray crystals in the sky are just the undersides of these crystallized trees that are in around the hole in the ground. This is made stranger by the fact that after you clear this quest and the tree stops shooting light at the sky, you can jump into the hole in the ground and you'll be put through a time tunnel, which warps you to the top of the tree. Which means that this, this, this thing, this thing right here, it's a literal wormhole. There's nothing illusory about it. And yes, its real in-game name is Time Tunnel. There's this one that takes you to the Spiral Abyss, the Perpetual Mechanical Array, and there's like three more in Enconomia. And the first time you pass through one, you get an achievement that calls itself a Dime Tunnel. So that is an official name. I did not make that up. But for the love of God and Ra and all things holy, Scaramouche, please come back and reconcile these damn stars because I can't take it anymore. All right, that's enough heavy analysis. It's time for the rapid fire roundup. The little section I put at the end of these little lore recap videos where I go over all of the random little ideas that weren't fleshed out enough to be their own section, but I still want to mention anyway. So here we go, starting off with the Oceanids. Now, it's very easy to miss this lore bit, but because the original Hydro Archon died and became the Amrita and the Vorokasha Oasis, the Oceanids of Fontaine often make pilgrimages to the Oasis to pay their respects and as a rite of passage. Most of the Oceanids don't care for their new Hydro Archon, Fosalor, and many of them left Fontaine entirely. One of them ended up in Springvale, and Rodea ended up in Chingsa. And yeah, I know, I, I don't think it's a mistake either that Oceanids look a lot like both the Seelies and the Perry. I'm thinking that maybe they might also be a type of Kavarna, you know, like of the former Hydro Archon, which would explain why they don't like the new one all that much. Speaking of, I put this in my Fontaine speculation video, but I wanted to mention it here too. The Mark of Apatia is named after the Zoroastrian god of drought, Apatia, who fought against the god of rain known as Tishtraya, or alternatively, Tir Yazad. But both of these deities took the forms of horses, one black, one white. What I neglected to add in my Fontaine video is that there are a lot of water horse mythologies out there. Kelpies and hippocamps immediately come to mind, and Poseidon, the great god of the sea, was said to be both the tamer and father of all horses. I think this, coupled with the repeated themes of purity, suggests that both the current and former Hydro Archons may be based on water horse myths. Or unicorns. Or both. We'll see. Apep had one line that completely threw me for an unexpected loop. She says, In war, the victor would inherit the right to shape the world while the losers must turn to ash. Which is a line basically lifted right out of the Travail trailer during the section on Natlin. I'm curious if, given the context, that Natlin is a rebellious nation against Celestia and that's why we don't meet any NPCs from there. Alternatively, I wonder if that's the nation where we suddenly get all of the dragon lore. Like, all of it. Just like, a whole, a whole slew of dragons. I, I want a dragon country. That'd be so cool. But here's another fun fact. The warden enemy inside of a pep is actually really, 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 really tiny. It's this little Magatama-shaped bean, and when I saw it, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd seen it before in a similar context, and I had. It turns out the Marana that you fight during the Aranyaka quest has a very similar symbol on the inside. It doesn't seem to correspond to any in-game language, so I'm not sure what it means, but since bits of a pep turned into the withering, I can't help but wonder if this incarnation of Marana was a bit of a pep too. 
Do you guys remember Babel? You know, the, the busty matriarch that took in Jet after her father died? Well, you can actually find a few notes scattered around the new area of the desert that talk about her parents. The short version of her story is that her mother was a Vahumana scholar who was traveling the desert with her husband and a Tanit bodyguard. Her mother ended up giving birth while her husband was away, and Babel did a number on her, is how it was put. The Tanit mercenary then put her mother out of her misery and decided to raise Babel in the ways of the Tanit. This makes Babel calling Jet an outsider kinda hypocritical and ironic since they literally had the same origins. Clementine has made a really nice video analysis on this, so I will leave a link below if you're interested in like the whole detailed story. Okay, last thing I want to cover. The songs of the Kavarna are something I didn't really think much of, although I did think it was kind of weird that they had a physical form, but then my buddy Saber pointed out something kind of odd. She said that the great songs all looked like this one part of the domain mural. And she's right. And that got me thinking. These great songs come from the Kavarna of the Goddess of Flowers, and the Goddess of Flowers also taught Ruka Devada something called the Source Song. And when Ruka Devada sang this song, it literally summoned an Ashvata tree directly from Ermansol, which then created an entire race of Aranara. So do you guys think that like songs are kind of like, like reality code? Like the Source Song is the source code of reality? Because if it is, then Venti is looking mighty suspicious all of a sudden. Well, more than usual, anyway. Venti's always suspicious, who am I kidding? But oh man, there are so many little details in this quest, I swear. Like, this one area of the desert has Enkanamian architecture, and how one area of the Vorokasha Oasis is like one of four areas in the whole game that has a voiced music track, and it just so happens to be a place where a god died. And, like, all of the Conrean's crazy technology information that totally deserves its own video in and of itself that I'll get to eventually, probably. Oh my god. I just... Ugh. And then there's all this stuff on hive minds that I really want to go over, and I will. That's my next video, I promise. But, man, this endless backlog of video topics never stops growing, and I'm drowning. I'm, I'm drowning right before Fontaine comes out. It's so fitting. Anyway, I have a lot to do and not a lot of time, so let me quickly but gratefully thank all of those crazy channel members for their unwavering support. It is incredible to watch you all grow in number, my god. I am equal parts humbled and flattered every time I gaze upon your little YouTube badges. You grow up so fast. But member or not, you made it all the way to the end of this video, so let me thank you specifically for watching. Take care of yourselves out there, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.